Hello, I'm Dr. Alan Partridge, and I'm joined today by Dr. Stephen Browning. We're both uh, with Adobe. Uh, uh, we're going to talk today about implementing skill-based learning at Adobe. So our focus today is actually on the implementation of skill-based learning in uh, Adobe's learning programs, and Dr. Browning is actively doing that project now, uh, so he'll be able to give us some enlightenment. Uh, I'm going to offer some high-level context to give you a sense of how we went about that uh, project and that implementation. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the overall strategy, uh, and I'll talk a bit about the strategy as we go through, with some particular emphasis on what drives learner engagement and motivation. Uh, and then we'll talk some about the Adobe on Adobe story. So we'll talk about how uh, Adobe used uh, our systems to actually implement our own uh, strategy overall and focus that strategy on skills. Uh, we'll get some more insights on that from Dr. Browning. So for with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Browning. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Steve Browning from the Adobe Learning Strategies team. Um, just quickly, uh, in telling the Adobe, Adobe on Adobe story uh, for skills implementation at Adobe, we'll hit three main areas. Um, <clears throat> the first is alignment. When you're building a skills structure, how do you make sure that you're building the right size of skills? How do, how do you make sure, sure that the, you're scoping the skills correctly so that they'll resonate with your learners and also with the stakeholders that um, are going to be invested in, in getting some of the reporting results from these? Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have a very specific and thought through change management structure in place. And a lot of this means no surprises, right? So you, these, you want to make sure that you have a lot of conversations going on as you're planning, you want to get as much buy-in and as much socialization as you can. And finally, there's a, there's a governance piece here that is going to really be necessary post-implementation. We won't do a lot of talking about that. But just be aware, if you're going to implement skills across your organization, you're going to need to make some rules around those skills. And back to Alan. Thanks, Steve. So we wanted to give you a kind of a high level understanding of the frame that we see that guides the overall process. And it's a fairly basic process. Um, essentially, it starts with your leadership team defining a business strategy. And understanding how you're going to align to the business strategy is really absolutely critical. And one piece of this is understanding that uh, we have a sort of a core philosophy that we're looking for return on expectation. So we're looking in the end to understand why, we're, learning, we're looking in the end to understand uh, what the original expectation was for the uh, learning outcome. And then we want to implement that in a way that's going to lead to that goal happening for your business, for your organization. And of course, the, the kind of norm in this space is to think of that instead as return on uh, investment, to think of this as dollars spent versus training outcomes achieved, but not so much training outcomes, but that ROI model looks at, you know, what was the cost versus how many people did I deliver it to? And that can be problematic because it aligns with an operational expense. We're really much more concerned with aligning with your overall business strategy and succeeding there. Uh, so we start with that piece. And then we move from that piece to the learning team assigning skills that align to that business strategy. So in, in that case, you're actually looking for those skills that align perfectly with the strategy of that specific business unit or that specific business goal. Uh, and then from there, it goes to the employees. And it's important to give the employees that opportunity to have a sense of autonomy. So the employees can actually choose the uh, best courses to satisfy the skills that they've been assigned. So that learning team takes those skills, assigns them out to people, and then based on those skills, they're able actually to make their own selections about courses and training that align to those pieces. And then finally, you want to validate that return on expectation with reports on skill achievement. So you want to be able to actually look from a managerial perspective and see, you know, did we actually reach those goals? And not just on a kind of a surface level, but in terms of boots on the ground change. So you want to actually be able to determine, uh, was there a noticeable change as a result in, uh, uh, of the training. Uh, you look at things like, uh, can the manager confirm that based on the training that Joe received uh, last month, uh, Joe is now negotiating contracts more effectively and to what extent more effectively, that's an actual boots on the ground kind of difference. And so that's kind of the, the, the uh, architecture that frames the way that we think about skills. Let me bring back Steve, uh, who can talk a bit more to the specifics. Thanks, Al. 
So where to start, right? You're an enterprise level organization, you want to implement skills as, as a kind of a structural element, a new structural element perhaps, um, in the way that you expose your learners to the training that they're doing, and as well as uh, you, the way that your managers are, are reviewing and uh, your managers are kind of getting reporting out on what uh, their employees are doing. So where we started was we began by only focusing on existing skills. Recognizing that skills mapping and skill structuring is an incredibly powerful tool to, to let you know what skills you need. Um, in order to implement the skill structure at Adobe, we really focused on what are the skills the field has now. Let's begin by mapping those out. Let's begin by mapping that known territory. Uh, the benefits of doing this is, again, this is a very big endeavor. So it, it gives us um, a bit, a bit of a time to pilot change management to make sure that we have the change management machine right. It gives us time to socialize the value of skills to make sure that everyone's comfortable with them. And it gives us time to put into place those structural elements, right? The elements around management processes and resource allocation and any kind of new document, documentation processes, uh, LMSs and other machines you may need to talk to each other in order to make skills really work well in your organization. Um, the other side benefit of this is as you're mapping skills for your existing field, you're getting a really good map of what training content you don't have to map those skills. And that's actually something that we're finding as we do our initial skills mapping endeavors at Adobe. We're constantly building out new curricula, new courses to address those skills. <clears throat> Eventually, for future state, we will be in a place to where once we have the machine up and running, once this skills machine is well oiled and chugling along very nicely, then we can go through and start using the machine to address gaps as they occur. So a little bit about hierarchies of skills. Uh, this is something that um, <clears throat> we're currently building out in our skills structure. So if you look here, um, there are really two views of skills that we feel we need to provide our, our, our audiences. Uh, the, the purple box here is the parent skill. And as you can see, that's, uh, that's designed for managers. And this isn't really a skill for managers, it's a skills report for managers. So it's a method of aggregating smaller skills and presenting them, them to managers in an executive, in an executive level way. Um, mostly these will be folks looking down um, on, on their pieces of the hierarchy, but certainly we want to be able to do some knowledge sharing across organizations as well. And again, that gets back to the governance conversations that you'll need to have. The orange skills are really where the rubber meets the road here. These are the child skills, and these are the skills that we expose our learners to. And this is really, you, you ask what's different about skills, this is what's different. The skills, as you can see, we have courses mapped under each of these skills. It may be two, it may be three, it may be one, it may be several. So they're not, not exactly one size fits all. But this child skill structure is something that we intend our learners to be able to look at and say, okay, I need to learn that for my next engagement. Or I need to learn that uh, in order to proceed to the customer that I would really like to be on. So these are what we call macro learning. Um, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, um, depending on your ability to invest in, in enablement activities. Uh, but this is something that is, is a bit of a, a near horizon type skill that you should be able to achieve. And as you can see, an aggregation of those child skills feeds up structurally into this parent skill. So one example of this, and this is a, a genericized version of, of just kind of a typical technical uh, product lifecycle, or customer, and, uh, customer engagement lifecycle rather. You start with needs, needs analysis, you go to project design, implementation, operation, troubleshooting, et cetera. Under each of those are really child skills, right? So you may be really good at needs analysis, but you may not be really great at, at active listening, or you may need some, some, some what we call soft skills. In that case, uh, that soft skill may be uh, one of those orange bullets under the needs analysis. Project design, um, you, may, you may be really great with roadmaps and blueprints, uh, but you need to work on how you articulate the business value, these kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> so this is, again, a generic customer engagement. I guess we could call it a life cycle. Um, this is what we start with for as we go to product groups, right? As we go to business units, we don't want to go to them with a blank piece of paper and just say, what do you do? What do your people do? Certainly we do that. But we want to be able to tell a single story across a very large organization so that folks from different pieces of the organization are, as much as we can make it possible, 
experiencing skills in the same way. And of course, we leave the very important TBD box down at the bottom because no single linear model is going to work for everyone. We're going to, we're going to remove pieces from some, we're going to um, plug in pieces and add things to others for different products, for different business units, et cetera. This is actually a picture of how our learners perceive this. So what you're looking at here is a list of all of those child level skills, right? This is a list of what can I do in the near term? Um, so this is actually as it's displayed in our, in our LMS Captivate Prime. Uh, we have the capacity to go in and explore and you can see on the left you see my skills and on the, on the, in the center column you see peer level skills. So this is really important. We, we can not only see what I'm working on, but what, what are my colleagues working on? And this data is populated by various kind of HR um, structures that will, that will feed this in. Um, we're, we're very excited actually about the ability for, for folks to say, okay, I really admire the way this person works. What, what's, his, her, or what's his or her skill set? Um, how's it different from mine? So just, this is just a little bit of how this appears to the learner. So Alan talked a little bit before about mapping skills to business strategies, right? And that's, a, that's one of those things that doesn't take very long to say, but it's an enormous, enormous statement. Um, so th these are a few ways that we're pursuing that. Um, as you can see, we've taken a linear model for our sales group and for our technical group. So um, you can see the, the middle piece here, the business analysis project design is really what we looked at earlier. There are similar methods of working, let's say, methods of engagement, perhaps cycles of engagement. We all have these models in our groups, right? This is where we have been able to go in and say, okay, let's, let's frame out what does that model look like for your people? Where do they start? Where do they go next? Where do they finish? Does, does one person need to have all of the pieces or does, do some people only need to have some of the pieces? <clears throat> now certainly, again, these models are gonna need some buttressing. They're gonna need some adaptation. These are a starting point so that we can tell that single story. That's gonna work for, for business practices where there is a kind of homogenous and adhered to structure. Um, for some skills, for some large bodies of skills, think about soft skills. Um, think about certain kinds of strategic thinking. Um, it's just not the case that this is going to be a linear model. In that case, we just figure out how do we best map those, how do we best build those parent skills, right? How do we best figure out those big buckets that managers need to be able to look at and say, in my organization, this many people have demonstrated that they have good presentation skills. This many people have demonstrated that they are able to walk into a C-level boardroom and do some great communication, et cetera, et cetera. And back to Alan. Thanks, Steve. So overarching this entire idea is a little bit of psychology, right? It's the basic idea of what motivates people. And we all experience this on a regular basis. We uh, figure that something motivates us or demotivates us all the time. Think of you being asked to do something in a hurry and how it immediately makes you feel like, no, why should I do that? <laughs> what good is that going to do? Um, what am I going to get if I do that? All those objections are the typical objections we hear. So if you look at this model, it's basically positive on top, negative on the bottom, external on the left, and internal on the right. And the core principle is this. It, we can try to motivate people by having positive external motivation. And that looks something like this. I'll give you a cookie if you do it. The problem with that is it's unsustainable. Uh, the other way that we often try to do it, uh, especially in our world of training and development, is the shotgun approach, right? Basically, we threaten you. Um, and if you don't think you do this, think about how you often will message to people that they must have a certain compliance training done by a certain deadline, or they're gonna get in trouble. You maybe escalate it to their boss and so on. So we try this, this is unsustainable as well. People will eventually stop believing that there will be the negative action that you're threatening. Uh, and then the other option there is you know, basically not ever gonna happen because that's internal and negatively motivated, so you're not gonna want to do it. Well, the one that interestingly Pink and others in this area uh, tell us will work is this one. I want to do it, so I will. And this is kind of the holy grail of learner engagement, this notion that a person is internally self-motivated. That's all cool and swell, but it doesn't help you unless I tell you a little bit about how to accomplish that. So if we look at how to accomplish that, we can really break it into these three basic buckets. Autonomy, 
mastery purpose. And if you think about those ob objections you might have to doing some project in a hurry, they all relate to these three basic principles. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed. It's that feeling of, um, I'm not going to do that because I am the master of my own time and destiny, right? And people all feel that way. So having a sense of autonomy is very empowering and very likely to increase your motivation for learners. The mastery component is just a desire to be recognized, right, by your boss or by your peers. And then finally, the purpose element is that why should I do this, right? When we have clarity of communication about what it is that's expected of me and why I should do it, what the motivation behind it is, we'll start to see much stronger buy-in to a learning culture overall. Yeah. So back to Steve to explain how that applies to the skills. Thanks. So, we begin here with something that I actually do strongly believe. Uh, people do want to learn. Um, people don't necessarily like to take tests. Um, so we are really trying to get out of the uh, hard assessment business as much as we can at Adobe. We, uh, we do have some really motivated people. If you learn more, you'll be able to do better on customer engagement. and you'll make more money. You'll be able to expand your horizons. You'll be able to, to, to serve your corporate organization better as a good corporate citizen, right? Um, to that end, we've devised what we call a challenge pack. And I'll go th through this quickly, um, but you can see there are three elements to the challenge pack here. Uh, the first is motivation. This is, this is, this is a kind of, think of it as an orchestrated experience. Um, it is probably most of the time about 80% hands-on, um, and it's, it's not about consuming content. The only content we will typically ask someone taking our challenge packs to consume um, is that first piece, the motivation piece. And in, in most cases, this has something to do with why are you about to learn what you're about to learn, right? In the technical world, why are you about to, to learn how to plug these two wires together and to make this machine run? In the sales world, why, why are you about to, to learn how to explain the business value of something? Uh, in the strategy world, why are you about to learn how to go in and evaluate your customers' websites according to these criteria, right? Basically, this all boils down to how does what you're about to learn help your customer, right? Um, typically, we try to do that through micro-learning, so we're talking about short videos. Um, you know, 10 minutes is, is a long video for us, so, so we're talking about maybe, um, maybe 10, maybe 15 minutes here uh, to do just some kind of consumption of what we call a traditional consumption of content. For the knowledge piece, um, this is what you need to do to successfully execute a use case. So this use case here, the endpoint, is where we're saying, this is all we say. We have a PowerPoint slide or something similar that says, customer X has this business need. Build them a machine using your technical skills, which uh, addresses that business need. Plug these two products together. Make these two digital mar marketing solutions talk to each other, right? That may be one. Uh, use this particular audit process to give them information they need about how successful their online presence is. Those kinds of questions. So in order to solve that, obviously they need some knowledge. Um, and this is really where we do not mandate Anything under this knowledge section, this walkthrough section, is the, we call it the walkthrough section, whenever possible, we will send them out, um, out into the wild, we call it, out into informal learning, right? We send them to the documents that the experts who are actually doing this stuff on a daily basis are maintaining for themselves and for others who are doing similar stuff. We send them to SharePoint. We send them to internal wikis. We send them to internal blogs. If we absolutely must, we will create content for this walkthrough, but we really want them to, to effectively learn how to fish on their own. So not only does this re reduce our burden as a content creation organization, but it helps us to tie them to these sort resources where they really need to be going all the time. All of this is really optional for completion of this use case, of this challenge pack. The, really the thing that they have to complete for the challenge pack is a successful deliverable, right, which addresses this use case. Depending on the use case, that deliverable could be a data architecture diagram. That deliverable, the deliverable could be actually the architecture that is represented by the data architecture diagram. 
Um, it could be a sales pitch. It could be a, a readout for a client of, of possible future moves for their strategy. Um, all of these things are possible deliverables for a challenge pack. And the final piece here is that we don't make folks take a test um, and we don't require that they go out and do certain curricula and check certain boxes in order to successfully rise to the challenge, right? Um, we build in this human element, uh, not to replace it, but to buttress the, the, the challenge because this is more challenging than just sitting down and reading some content and taking a test. And that's what you see across this, the bar across the bottom here. Um, we give a social element to the challenge pack so that, so that folks, if they're struggling, if they're stuck, they can go to a Slack channel. Um, they can go to office hours, which are held by experts on the topic. Um, as you can see here, this, this is the person who is eventually gonna say, you did that, that's done, congratulations. Um, or, you know, how about this other way of thinking about it? Um, not quite coaching in a formal sense, but more of, around office hours and support. Um, and these, these people who provide the support will typically be uh, someone who's been brought into the challenge just to evaluate it, could very well be the author of the challenge who worked with the enablement team to build it, or, or in some cases it'll be an instructor who, who's using the challenge as part of a formal curriculum. Um, and these challenges, think of them as courses. Um, they are a certain piece of completion that someone needs to do in order to attain a skill. And again, as we saw earlier, it can be one challenge slash course. It could be two, three, four challenge slash courses. So as an enablement professional, I hear, I hear this a bit. You guys are great for school smarts, uh, but we need school smarts and street smarts. And that's a super valid point, and it's one that we've really taken to heart. And this diagram represents how we, how we do that. In order to say, okay, you have achieved this skill, or you have achieved this job level. Um, you, have, you have accumulated enough skills and experience so that now we're going to, to assign you to a different group, or we're gonna take some sort of organiza organizational action to reward you on that. Uh, this is really how we do that at the moment. Um, on the left side of the screen, you see the training. So you can see, again, I talked about parent skills, the large skills. And these are, uh, for, for this hypothetical analytics business consultant level one. And again, this is very genericized. Um, the, the project design piece would be something that we would need a parent school. We would need a big bucket of skills for someone to even attempt that job. Same with project launch. This is something that they're definitely gonna to need to be able to go in and flip all the right switches and make sure everyone's comfortable as the project goes on. Just relatively arbitrarily, some of the technical skills that may, be, uh, may contribute to this as well. These would be child skills, smaller level skills, more achievable skills. Uh, we may want someone to have some serious uh, JavaScript coding. Uh, we want someone to be able to go in and deal with, with the technical people. And we want someone to go in uh, kind of conversely and deal with the C-level executives, right? So, so what's represented here in the training box would be kind of a prereq. Or you can almost think of it like that as a prereq to an engagement. What's represented in the right-hand box is going in and saying, okay, now that you've gotten this training and now that you feel that you have the chops, let's see them. Go get some, some street smarts. Go out and co-lead an analytics engagement. Right? Go out and, and actually demonstrate this. So if we, as an enablement organization, have done our job right, they will have gone through a lot of challenge packs on the left-hand side, on the training piece, and they will have done that skill application, and that skill application is going to resonate with them because it, it's going to look a lot like what they find when they actually go out and co-lead that analytics engagement. At the point at which they've successfully done both of these tasks, um, then it's, it's their responsibility to, let's say, kind of put together a kind of portfolio. This is what I've done. Um, and then they, they will schedule a meeting to see, uh, to meet with various leaders, uh, various managers, to say, okay, here's what I've done. What do you guys think? Am I, am, am I ready to progress to this, to this next level? Am I ready to have 
this new title. So again, skills, book smarts, plus actual engagements, street smarts. If we've done our job as an enablement organization, there should be harmony there and not dissonance. And once they've completed that, that is the path forward and the path upward for them.